Um, it's now my pleasure to turn the conversation once again. Uh, we're going to veer a totally different direction uh, to cybersecurity. And we are going to bring out uh, John Herring. John, if you could come on out. John is, I think I, for those of you who were here this morning, um, I think I told you that uh, we were going to have the equivalent of a white hat hacker. Were you ever a black hack, black, black hat hacker, John? Hard to say. Hard to say. You're never allowed to admit that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, John is the founder and executive chairman of Lookout. If you don't know what Lookout is, uh, it, is an, uh, it is something you can, well, you can download it. You can do all sorts of things on your telephone. And we'll get into the telephone piece of it in just a second. But I want to, given the news, and we talked about uh, some of this earlier this morning. We were talking with the Treasury Secretary about the Sony Pictures hack. Um, and given your knowledge of hacking writ large, you spend every year at DEF CON. You, mm. you, 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 you hacked into the, was the Oscars or the American, uh, was it the Oscars yeah, that you, you hacked? Awards. When you see that, what do you think? Do you say, oh, I know who did this, I know how to do this, I know I could do this? Well, I think <clears throat> the big change with Sony in particular, and I think Sony is a game changer, is the level of collateral damage that exists. So you look at you know, the Target hack or the Home Depot hack, and these are things that compromise internal systems and, and put you know, in the customers at risk, credit card numbers, things of that nature. Sony, this has struck the core of the company at a fundamental level. It's impacting customers and, more importantly, employees. I mean, if you look at this, there were, and if you've seen some of the paste bin files, emails about you know, people trying to, to, trying to get pregnant or people trying, you know, personal things, credit card information about the individual employees, people's salary information. And I think this, this hack in particular is striking at a level that we've never seen before. And does that get done by a group of two people in, in, a, in a garage somewhere? Is that a team of people when people say it could be uh, a country like North Korea that's, that, that's sponsoring something like this? Yeah. Is, it, is it a handful of guys? at DEF CON who could do this? Uh, well, what I'll say is we don't know. Attribution is a very complicated subject. I think what we do know is this This is a very sophisticated attack. Um, but but it, sophisticated it, means what? When people, you, we read all this all the time, and people say, oh, it's a sophisticated attack. And I, does that mean that you are a sophisticated guy, therefore you could do this? So what I would say is the, the, the attack in particular it probably had quite a lot of resources. And what it, most similarly, it's so, so just for those who don't know, it's um, called a wiper attack. And what ends up happening is this malware found its way onto the network. It looks on the, the PC that it found its way onto for a specific set of files. It uploads those files and then erases them afterwards. And then once it's done with what it's doing, overwrites the master boot record so the PC is rendered useless. It then spreads itself and does that to every computer in the network. And it's most similar in, in, in kind of code to something called Shamoon, which was similar to something called Flame, which you may have heard of took out 30,000 Saudi Aramco PCs at a very significant level. Um, and and this, the, you know, there are a lot of correlations to nation state level sophistication in this attack. And how many people, does, is, it, is this about the number of people or is this about the servers and the computing power behind it? I think it's a really about the kind of characteristics of how they found their way onto the network how deeply they permeated the network, and then the ability to exfiltrate over 25 gigabytes of data, you know, just in, into, you know, the, the most scary thing about this to me is the, the creation date of the original file uh, was July 7th, 2014. So there are examples of code related to the file that happened within Sony that existed in the wild. This attack should have been prevented. It should have been prevented because they could have, they could have stopped it then. The, there, they should have. The, I believe that there was an opportunity to at least at a minimum see this happening because the, this was not technically a zero-day attack. And then two, the, the, the IT security policies. I mean, there was a folder on one of the PCs called passwords with many of the most important passwords for the network sitting in that folder, uh, which is not good. Uh, <laughs> and so you put this, how much of this do you put on Sony? And how much of this do you put on, we were talking to the Treasury Secretary again, what is the role of government in all of this? Uh, look, I think you know, the FBI was very quick to respond. And you know, the government has you know, a very vested interest in protecting critical infrastructure and corporate networks of, of our nation. At the end of the day, you know, we have to defend ourselves. Um, and companies need to do that. And I think that you, know, you, you looked at what happened with Target. I, I, I hope that this kind of helps elevate the level of seriousness of these types of issues to a CEO and board level conversation, this, this will be a moment in time that, that will fundamentally alter the future of Sony for one way or another. And I don't think this is an isolated incident. I think this is a new normal. 
when, when you look at, at Home Depot or Target or any of these other breaches recently, do you say they could have gotten at the kind of stuff they got at Sony, but they just didn't because they didn't want to? Or do you say that, that the other that stuff was just so hard to get at? I think it was a very different situation in both cases. You know, the way that the Home Depot or the Target attacks, you know, permeated themselves uh, were very different than Sony. And so, you know, those were clearly going after uh, more financially motivated, going after credit card information. Th this was, uh, you know, something that they were looking right. to strike the heart, the heart of the organization. I've asked you this question before, uh, not here, but I, I, I ask it again. What is the chance that everybody who's sitting in here wakes up one morning and they log on to their, their local bank, whether it's Chase or Bank of America or, or, or whatever it is, and they see their balance is zero? So, really? I mean, I, I just... I, I think practically speaking, you know, the banking and financial service industry is actually one of the best at protecting our, our, our assets, if you will, from a cybersecurity perspective. It's actually quite good. Um, funny enough, they're great at protecting the customers. I think that in many industries, though, protecting the corporations themselves are, are you know, what is most risky. And I think while that could happen, we could get fished. I think passwords are the greatest risk for us as individuals, weak passwords. If we look at it, there's a high likelihood that if we came back next year, many people in this room will have been compromised because of the company they work at was compromised. And I think that, that you know, the companies are becoming massive targets for a variety of reasons, both kind of political and, and kind of corporate espionage driven. Do you think if you picked out anybody in this audience right now and said, I, I, I want to get at their email? No, I, I'm, I'm really, I'm very serious. Do you think that if, with, given enough time and energy that you could figure out how to do it? I, look, it's a very different world. When I look at everyone in the room, I see information. I mean, there's information floating out in the air, and you just have to know how to grab it. Um, and you'd be surprised. You know, I, I showed you a demo before that many of your mobile devices are broadcasting every location you've been in the past 90 days. And I just have to write a script. To, tell everybody to about that, that, by the way, because so, it, 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 do a public service. Just to tell everybody what we're talking about. I think, you know, the concept of security and privacy, are, it's a very, very fine line. And these mobile devices that we have are phenomenal. They've changed our lives for the positive and they're, they're a fundamental part of our lives. But the kind of digital exhaust or the information that, that, that comes off of them is far greater than we realize. And oftentimes, things that get built into them for, for kind of normalized features for commercial purposes, like tracking your location to better serve you ads, for example, or make your maps more accurate, actually can be used maliciously with unintended consequences. And in this case, um, Wi-Fi. So on Wi-Fi, when, if you leave your Wi-Fi on your mobile phone, on many different types of devices, it will remember every access point you've ever connected to. And when it's running around and not connected to anything, it broadcasts out to other access points, hey, are you here? But it also says, hey, are any of you here? And those, are any of you, are every access point you've connected to in the last 90 days. I can just sit and listen. It's just broadcasting to that. Go correlate that to a database and see literally every physical location on GPS you've been in the past 90 days by address. Um, and that's not hacking you. That's me just listening. It'd be like someone shouting secrets in the room, and I just hear them. He did this, and it was, it was uh, to me, and it was, uh, <laughs> it was astonishing. Um, let me ask you a different question, and it goes to the phone business, which is, is, the, is the business you, you are in. Um, Apple and others have recently decided that they, uh, for security purposes, are going to encrypt all of their information. Mm -hmm. You've heard Google, uh, Google is going to be doing the same. Mm -hmm. Um, at the same time, we've heard the government actually come out and say, this encryption is a problem for us. Mm -hmm. Because, and, and the example that I think the head of the CIA and others have given is, uh, if you're a parent and, and, you're, and, and, you're, and you had a child that was kidnapped, it would be very hard for us to then go uh, find the phone of the person. If, if, we, if we knew the email address of the perpetrator, we still couldn't read their email. Mm -hmm. Where do you land on, on this issue of privacy? in an age of Edward Snowden, in an age of skepticism by other countries, by the way, as well. Yeah, so I think you know, we've been living in a world where there was a lot of unknown about what had been happening. And you know, in the wake of what, what took place with Snowden, uh, when you look at that, it created a, an inherent mistrust, especially with nations abroad and with Silicon Valley, um, between us and our government. And well, I, well, I think that you know, the intentions of our government generally are you know, for the greater good of the people and protecting from, from bad things happening, 
that issue caused that significant distrust. And I think what you're seeing, WhatsApp's a great example. They've just um, adopted an open technology called Text Secure to encrypt all communications. That's a huge step forward. They're shifting the balance of power and making it so instead of them being told what will happen to them, them having a seat at the table in that conversation. And by no means do I think it obviates the government's ability to go request information, but it forces it to be a request and a conversation rather than being told what to do. Um, and there's a great saying, if you, if you don't have a seat at the table, you're on the menu. I think Silicon Valley felt like it was on the menu and they're changing that power dynamic. And, but how much of that was a commercial decision to say, I'm Apple and I want to sell my devices, for example, in China. And if I can say everything is encrypted, uh, the government there and the people mm -hmm. there will feel more comfortable in a, in a post-Snowden world. Yeah. And how much of it uh, was based on some other type of moral or other judgment? I, you know, I think it's hard to comment. No doubt it's important uh, in, in the context of doing business and commercial success abroad. But in my perspective, uh, uh, Facebook and Google in particular, I think it's because they believe it's the right thing to do. When you look at your business, and we haven't really talked about what your business does, but it effectively protects your phone uh, in a much more meaningful way than, unfortunately, the phones uh, mm. come today. Mm -hmm. How exposed is the phone itself, and what can a hacker, I mean, you, you go to Vegas every year at DEF CON, and they literally try to hack into everybody's. What can you actually get from the phone? I mean, you, you know, your phone is your most personal computer. It knows more about you than perhaps anyone in your life. I mean who you talk to, where you are, your banking information, your passwords, your you know, personal information. And so you'd be surprised. While I, I wouldn't say the sky's not falling, but it is definitely possible to hack mobile devices, and it's happening every day. In fact, you know, there's examples of you know, malware that we've seen that have infected upwards of four or five million people in the US and created a you know, large distributed botnet. So if so I download Lookout, is my phone 100% safe? No, so what I'll tell you is nothing is 100% safe. Like as a hacker, anything can be hacked. And between, Put me in front of anything, what, and and between downloading what you have on, on, on my phone and what the phone comes with, what's the difference? Yeah, so we, we, we look at the world from a perspective of data. So take the Sony breach, for example. There were a bunch of signals and outliers in the world that they could have utilized to understand you know, as an early warning because it wasn't unique what, what might happen to them. And right now, the state of the art of security, you hear about real time or zero day, we don't think that's good enough. We think security needs to become predictive. And you need to be able to use data and use insight to predict threats before they happen. And we have approaching 100 million people using our products. You know, it's growing very, very rapidly. We use that distributed base of users to gather information about what's happening in the world. And then we take slight correlations and we use that, we process that using machine intelligence in the cloud to say, you know what, this thing we see exhibits no bad behavior. Uh, it doesn't look bad and no traditional security mechanism would protect against it, but because it has this snippet of code that we know was written by this malware author and is connected to this IP range, which we also know is malicious, we can assign a risk score and say there's a 95% probability it will become malicious at some future point. And you then therefore do what? Block it. You block it. Yeah. And you share that information with others. Yeah, so we've built a platform and that's the idea is we, our vision over the long term is to not only become the central source for kind of predictive machine intelligence on security, but become a platform that others can hook into. So there's many different instances of companies with products that everyone here are using that are plugged into Lookout Security Cloud to kind of extend that functionality to the broader world. And, and again, going back to the government, the role of the government, when you think about the police, you see police on the street and, and they're policing things, but everybody has to have a, a lock on their door, mm -hmm. if you will. How, who's really supposed to be protecting that door in the end, in, in the internet age? I think that the only, the only protection you can really count on is your own in this world. And when I say that, it's such a complicated world. Look, the government has to protect themselves. This is already a, a big enough challenge, and I, and I don't think we've invested nearly enough. So the, my sense is, is that you know, it's incumbent upon every part of the stack, from the creators of the technology themselves, to the users to take additional steps, to you know, government to, to, to play their part as well. And, and it's gonna take you know, a concerted effort from all parties to be involved. And look, the honest truth is, as long as human beings are writing computer code, there's going to be vulnerabilities or bugs in that code. When is it the time, when, if, if you know about a hack, how much information do you share with the government? And how much information have they shared with you over time? I mean, look, I mean, when we're we talking about, we're trying to 
figure out what that balance is supposed to be like, too. Right. I mean, there, look, we, we collect, our loyalty is to the individuals that we protect, whether they you know, you know, are an individual, a business, or a government user. And we care about protecting people. So you know, we work very closely with governments to help ensure we can provide protection. If we find an attack you know, that's happened on our network of users, we think is much broader, we'll share that intelligence information that allows them to right. take action to protect, protect the other users. Um, before we go, if you could give everybody just one sort of useful suggestion, what is the one thing we should all just selfishly do okay. to protect ourselves? So passwords are the most important point of security and also the weakest point of security for most people. And it's very complicated. Everyone thinks you need multiple characters, you know, lowercase, uppercase, you can't even remember it. Length is all that matters. Write a really, really, really long sentence that's very easy for you to remember and do that with every password. Don't keep the same password. You'll increase your security by an order of magnitude. It's the, so how, how many letters? I mean, mine is like a paragraph. <laughs> no, no, really. I, I'm joking. I mean, look, eight, ten words. Eight or ten words? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like a sentence. Yeah. But it's very easy to remember. You say, uh, you know, John was in New York this week. Done. And, and, and we're going to leave it there. John, thank you. Great. Thanks. I appreciate it very, very much. Thank you.